Welcome to everybody. Um, hello, I apologize for a couple of minutes delay. Um, my name is Richard Beardsworth. I am Professor of International Relations. I research on politics of climate change. Um, I'm head of School of Polis, and I will be your chair uh, for this webinar today. I also, I suppose, in this context, it's important I co-chair the COP27 uh, uh, task force. So this event is um, from, I hope you can all see me now, um, from COP27 to COP28, what went well, what went badly, and what comes next? So very much the transition uh, from um, last November to this coming November, December. The um, Let me just say a few words about the schedule and one housekeeping rule, um, and then <clears throat> I will turn to our four speakers. I will introduce them quite briefly so that we can get on uh, with the business of the day. Um, and then uh, I will hand over to the first speaker, who will be Professor Ian Klacher, and each of the speakers will hand over to each other, and I will pick up afterwards. So the schedule, um, with regard to our theme, uh, it will, just after I finish um, introducing, uh, each speaker will speak for about five minutes uh, on the topic that concerns them with regard to the COP process and COP27, uh, in particular, looking forward to COP28. Um, once the speakers have finished, uh, I will make some summary remarks with regard to what they've said, and I may add one or two things, um, and I will then turn it uh, quickly uh, to keep our four panelists very much at the forefront of this. I will turn it to a panel discussion among the speakers, uh, which will be for about 20 minutes. Um, and it may well be that within that discussion, I ask them some individual questions. That will go on till about half past uh, 12, so just under an hour's time. And then the last 25 minutes, uh, we will have an open uh, Q&A with uh, the audience. Um, and I'm presuming everybody knows uh, how to put in their questions and they will be ranked. So I will look um, to uh, those that are most popular or that are most recurrent. Uh, I will then close uh, by uh, two o'clock. Um, it's quite a compressed schedule, so I'd, I'd like to get on with it quickly. But one important housekeeping rule, please. I think we all know this very well, especially if we work uh, with social media, um, is that if there is a question from, from any of you, please um, be respectful and let's make this a collaborative space. It is being recorded. Uh, it will go up on YouTube. Um, and it's important that we are able to uh, promote this precisely as a collaborative discussion among ourselves and ultimately with external people as well. So um, let me turn now to our speakers. Our first speaker will be Professor Ian Klacher, who is Professor of Pensions and Finance at the Leeds University Business School. He's also Pro Dean of International for the school and leads the university's Center for Financial Technology and Innovation. He is an international expert. He's called on a lot uh, nationally and internationally on fund management um, and also leads on climate and environmental risk analytics for pensions and asset management for the UK Centre for Greening Finance and Investment. And Ian, very obviously, is going to speak to the very big question uh, within the COP uh, process uh, of climate finance. Ian will then hand over to John, Professor John Barrett, um, who is a Professor of Energy and Climate Change Policy in the School of Earth and Environment. He is a national and international expert on sustainable consumption and production, on carbon accounting, and more widely, the transition to a low carbon pathway to low carbon economies. Um, John has built global trade models to understand embedded carbon emissions in goods and, and services and upstream carbon emissions from emerging energy technologies. And these techniques have been used by several government departments in the UK. So his research is very, very impactful um, on government and government climate action. John will then hand over to Sumeda, Sumeda Basu. Um, Sumeda is a postdoctoral researcher 
in the School of Earth and Environment. She works on urban energy governance, <clears throat> excuse me, climate change policy and politics. And she also advises um, a network of parliamentarians, South Asian parliamentarians in particular, and attended COP27 on behalf of that network, which is called Climate Parliament. Sumeda will then hand over to our last uh, presenter, uh, speaker, uh, Kate Fernio. Uh, Kate is a, an alumni of the University of Leeds. She graduated from the MSc in Climate Change and uh, Public Policy in um, 2019. I think I got the title of that wrong, but I think we, we know what it is. Um, uh, is advisor and UNFCCC science negotiator in the department now for energy security and net zero. And Kate, and this is of great interest to, to us for today, is Kate acted on behalf of the UK government in climate negotiations at COP27 summit, and her general purview was the question of uh, climate science, science in general. So those are our speakers. I'm going to turn now immediately, given the time to them. Panelists, um, please uh, turn on your cameras now so we can all see you. Um, and I would ask Ian uh, to start us off, please. Ian, over to you. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, so I think I'm going to go one step back in time to COP26, because I think that's quite important in the context of climate finance. And at COP26, what we've seen was something which was a step change in terms of the COP process. So climate finance and finance had its own day for the first time. And so there was a finance day and I was very fortunate to be in Glasgow to really quite considerable announcements, particularly things like GFAN, so the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which was um, put in place by Mark Carney. And that ended up being about £130 trillion of investments globally that was committed to going green um, and trying to sort of fund the transition in some way, shape or form. And that covers across banks, insurers, pension funds, asset managers. So it was it was vast in its scope. And we're talking about some of the largest global pension funds, asset managers, banks. So it wasn't just about the weight of money, the geographic cover of that coverage of that money was really quite significant. And COP26 was an announcement COP. So we got all our announcements. And as we then moved towards COP27, which is uh, implementation COP, as I'm learning about the COP cycles, I realise there's an announcement cycle and an implementation cycle. It's, it's an interesting thing to start to get involved in because it's not a natural place for somebody who does pensions to be. But what we've seen in the, the gap between COP26 and COP27, and it's continuing today, is this is all starting to fracture a little bit and it's starting to show a lot of straining cracks. And there's a number of things that are driving that. One is it's very hard to do. It's very, and this is not to, uh, I should be clear, these are my views, they're nobody else's. So anybody I'm associated with is not responsible for this view. It's my existential crisis that I'm currently going through. Um, is it's very hard to do. It's good to make announcements. It's good to get coalitions. But when you get to the opera, making that work, the opera, like, oh, it won't come. Um, making it happen, it's much harder. And that's because everybody makes announcements, then goes back to their day job. So you go back to lending, you go back to making pension funds, money, asset management, and so on. And you've got a fiduciary duty. So when you're a pension fund, your job is to pay pensions. Now, there is an aspect of that where we would want better risk management, but ultimately that's, a, that's an ongoing process and evolution. So you can't shift money from one stage to the next with the flick of a switch. And what we've seen in terms of these cracks is some of the larger, larger asset managers, so Vanguard, for example, um, they left the GFANS Alliance, huge global asset manager. We've seen politics start to butt up against finance. So we've seen... Um, 
Texas, for example, saying that public pension funds won't be able to invest in asset managers who have ESG as an objective, particularly around environment and so on. And we've seen other large players within the GFANS Alliance starting to get a bit jittery. And that's because they're worried about constructive obligations as far as based upon everything that you see in the press, that by getting involved in doing something, it may create an obligation that the company doesn't want. So when we then go from there to COP27, all those announcements that were present in, the, in, in Glasgow are already starting to feel stressed and shaky. And actually, when I look at COP27, I feel quite disappointed for an implementation COP. And it's because for me, not a lot happens. So there was a huge announcement around the loss and damage fund. And that was a really important thing for the G77 to hold out on. But it's what I describe as an empty bucket problem. So everybody's agreed that we should have a bucket, but nobody's put any money in it. And the money that goes towards these things isn't big enough and it isn't fast enough to really have the impact that we would want. I think we've seen also some discussions about the reform of the World Bank and the IMF. And I think that's a very welcome thing but ultimately, it's again extremely hard to do. It's not going to be something that we can do, which is going to be rapid and quick and release the, 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 the huge sums of money that we need today and accelerate that process. So as we then look forward, I think the thing which the discussion was started at COP27 around resilience and adaptation, and I think that discussion is very important in the context of finance because it helps you think about this in a risk return sort of scenario. So you can then start to think about if I build in resilience and or adaptation into what I'm doing, it lowers my risk. As a result, I can accept a lower return. And I think that's a very useful framing within finance. But as we then move towards COP28, I think the real challenge of COP28 is going to be mechanisms by which the capital flows. And so for me, I think that's where the challenge is. And if we miss that opportunity at COP28, I think it's going to be ever harder to get progress in the right direction. So I'm now going to hand over to John and looking forward to the discussion and debate. Thank you, Ian. Um, within taking a finance perspective, I'm going to look at this more from a mitigation uh, perspective. And I suppose also reflect on the fact that last week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change also released their report, Synthesis Report, um, which really showed very clearly the rapidly sort of closing window of opportunity to secure a sustainable and livable future for all. Um, the goal, I suppose, of COPS is to collectively bring people together to agree uh, a global direction and to achieve um, from a mitigation perspective um, limiting uh, global warming to under 1.5 degrees from pre-industrial times. So therefore, is it success? No, it's an absolute abject failure because we have not collectively managed to come together to achieve that goal. And the IPCC report shows that the window of opportunity for 1.5 degrees is pretty much gone. Um, and this has been known for some time. So we really have collectively not been able to come together to solve a global problem, despite the fact that we actually have all the technologies in place to achieve this, all the sort of switches and changes in social practices and norms which are all possible to achieve that goal. And one of the gravest warnings which the IPCC gave was along the lines of that uh, we have enough uh, existing fossil fuel infrastructure that will exceed 1.5 degrees except we're still not actually stopping the development of that infrastructure. And this isn't just a problem for countries where economies are growing rapidly. Uh, it is also happening for the UK. We have opened our, or have given permission for the first coal mine to be open in decades, uh, despite the evidence giving a public inquiry to show that this is in complete contradiction with climate policy. And this is a country which in essence says that we're a world leader in tackling these issues. Uh, in essence, we fail to pick up in COP the dangers of continued expansion of, of uh, coal, oil, and of gas reserves. 
So if we're looking forward now to the next one, it's really the choices and actions implemented in the next decade, which will have impact for thousands of years to come. And it's at this point that if there isn't a collective action, the two degree target is under considerable threat. And so with a decade to act, with the technologies in place that we know exist, and also our options to help put forward and, and lead in a low carbon sort of prosperous society, we in essence have the opportunity to make a difference. But until we actually acknowledge that we should not be uh, unlocking any further fossil fuel resources, and until that sits at the heart of discussion and debate and is clearly stated by all, this becomes a talking shop about opportunities as opposed to a place where action could actually happen. The other key element which I think is lacking and has been across the whole debate is the sort of slightly tame response from developed countries to recognize the historical implications of their actions. And in essence, I think the job here, even for a country like the UK, which is relatively small in terms of global emissions, is the opportunity that we face to show that there is a positive future that can exist for all people in the country while rapidly reducing emissions. And we need to be able to demonstrate what that looks like and demonstrate that it's possible. And that, I think, is what we'll be looking for, to be able to go and approach the next uh, COP, showing what can be done with a positive mindset of what is possible. The final point that I wanted to make before handing on was to do with the alignment of climate policy with economic and social policy. We're still seeing climate policy almost sitting in isolation and relating to the rapid rollout of key technologies, which is clearly one element of it. But that can easily be underdone if we don't focus on reducing energy demand by actually driving forward social changes and ensuring that any economic investment policies are aligned with a reduction in emissions. Without those three working together, we will continue to place them against each other and believe conflict exists where it's not needed. And if this kind of language can be discussed and becomes part of future COPs, then potentially there's an opportunity. Based on past experience, I think there's a long way to go. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Samida. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, so I work in the field of urban energy, so I'll be talking about these two aspects uh, separately. Um, I will have very little to talk about urban because that's not um, prominently discussed in climate negotiations. Uh, cities in general, uh, do not have a formally recognized role in climate negotiation. So as a result, uh, you know, cities are not often part of these negotiations, uh, except for the side events that we see in COP27. Um, but there are several activities that are discussed as part of climate negotiations, which form an integral part of uh, cities. And therefore, you know, it is important to talk about the urban infrastructure, urban energy systems, uh, etc. Uh, so some of the things that happened in COP27 was, uh, well, uh, from the point of view of cities, maybe only partially, uh, you know, partially beneficial or partially encouraging. Uh, one of the things that were good were, that was good was the linking of different sectors within the urban um, systems. So, for instance, there was a formal recognition recognition that rivers, food, you know, other biosphere um, elements are sort of interlinked. And there was this, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, you know, obvious uh, sort of statement put in the uh, negotiation that there is a right to healthy environment. All these sort of have an, have a very important linkage to how we see our cities growing and evolving, and particularly in developing countries. Um, the second part of my intervention would be, uh, of course, on energy itself, uh, you know, and, and because I work uh, on urban energy, that conversation forms a very important part. Um, on energy, uh, COP27 sort of delivered very little, um, and that is because uh, it's it sort of, uh, you know, missed on the opportunity of having some great ambitions that was put on the table. And this also sort of goes on to say how important uh, crop, uh, COP presidency is usually and how it sort of negotiates the agenda throughout the COP process. So what I'm referring to here is the 
issue of phasing down of uh, fossil fuels versus phasing down of coal. Um, and uh, from what the report said, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of support for phasing down of fossil fuels in this COP, but it was cate categorically put down by the Egypt presidency and it was watered down to quite a, uh, you know, uh, it was watered down uh, quite a bit. Um, there was also space uh, put as, as you know, some of the negotiation uh, text shows, there was also some space created for low emission renewable energy sources uh, or uh, low emission energy sources, which some say could, you know, uh, could provide space for fossil fuel gas to enter our en energy transition discourse. Um, having given you this sort of uh, rather uh, dim view of COP27, there were certain activities that were also quite encouraging. One of them was the uh, Just Energy Transition uh, Partnership that was uh, sort of uh, struck with the Indonesian government. In COP26, so there was uh, a similar agreement signed with the South Asian, uh, South African uh, government, and so this this sort of uh, almost marked the progress of these uh, uh, you know of these uh, dialogues with other fossil fuel dependent economies. We also saw uh, some progress in the uh, alliance of countries that want to go beyond uh, oil and gas. So you know uh, beyond all oil and gas alliance or uh, you know, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, that sort of uh, initiatives, uh, uh, they received a lot of traction during the negotiation, of course. Uh, and also we saw some amount of action, again, beyond the negotiations, of course, on uh, methane uh, ambitions and methane mitigation ambitions. So these were some of the important developments. And uh, the last development that I might want to mention here, which I think is going to be a key uh, sort of uh, a key area to uh, to sort of uh, follow uh, even in COP28 is the the high level expert group on non state entities uh, primarily looking at how should they should uh, report their emission targets and uh, you know how they should account their emission reduction uh, throughout the uh, process so there was some strong uh, sort of discussion on that front as well um Going ahead uh, to the COP28 part, I would think, as I mentioned, there is a lot of importance on who's conducting the COP negotiations. And uh, I just hope that, you know, uh, UAE does a better job than what was done in COP27. And some of the ambitions, particularly on the mitigation side of things, can be brought up uh, again in the priority list. Uh, this COP, COP27, was more of an, uh, uh, of an adaptation COP which was great. And, and I think there was a historical step taken towards loss and uh, damage fund. But if mitigation is not prioritized equally, there is really no uh, point of adaptation or loss and damage funds for that matter. We'll never be able to raise uh, that many funds, uh, that much of funds ever. Um, I think just last uh, bit, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, you know, I would also like to see, of course, you know, enhanced ambitions uh, from all the countries involved. Uh, who are coming and attending uh, COP28, but I'll al I'd also like to see how we can look at, you know, bringing forward some of the uh, emission reductions that have been put into place. So particularly net zero targets that are currently in the range of 2047, 2050, uh, how they could be brought forward a little bit so that space can be made available to some of the other emerging economies uh, who are trying to uh, transition their economies, but they will still take some time. Uh, at the same time, while this is done, I would also like some uh, commitment to be placed on the table by these emerging economies to address the inequities within their uh, domestic situation. Because I think far too long we have gone ahead with this discourse that, you know, uh, because of because of the inequalities or because of the uh, sort of developing conditions within these countries, they cannot take adequate step, steps towards renewable energy. But I think, you know, at the same time, an equal amount of importance needs to be put on how they are uh, making these inequalities go away within their uh, domestic uh, sort of uh, domain. Um, yeah, I'll stop at that. I have of a couple of more points, but I can always bring in uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, I'll hand over to Kate now. 
Thank you. Thanks very much, Sumeda. Um, and yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Kate. Um, I work in the International Climate Science team in the Department for Energy and Security and Net Zero, as Richard said. Um, I did my master's in climate change and environmental policy at Leeds four years ago. So yeah, it's a real privilege to come back um, and speak at this event and see some familiar faces. Um, so my role is as a climate science advisor. Um, so how that relates to COP um, was during the UK's COP presidency, I was seconded to the negotiations team to support them in ensuring that their policy and positions were evidence-based. So we provide science advice to them. Um, so I think, yeah, people will probably know how the timescales work, but the, the UK actually had two years due to the pandemic as the incoming presidency for COP26, where they sort of took up the formal role as presidency for a year. And then at the start of COP27 in Egypt, they handed that presidency over. Um, and I joined the team in June last year to work specifically on a couple of science negotiation items. And like I said, to kind of support other negotiators across the team to make sure that the position is built on, on the best available science. Um, and yeah, it's very apt that John mentioned the, the IPCC report that was released last week. Um, so that's another key part of the work that our team does as, as contributors to the, the government to that process where governments approve that report. So that's kind of what we use and consider the best available science and, and ensure that that's as integrated into the UNFCCC process um, as possible. Um, so obviously there were there were lots of outcomes at, at COP27 as as we've already heard and I, I can't speak for them all. Um, it, it's hard to be in uh, in all of those places at once. But some of the key headlines before I sort of zoom into the area that I was covering. Um, so as people have mentioned, the the breakthrough on funding arrangements for loss and damage um, was huge um, and sort of responded to the concerted calls from the poorest and most vulnerable countries. Um, and sort of the details of that will be a key priority um, for most countries looking to COP28 as as people actually work out how to to operationalise that fund um, and the range of sources and contributors that will be considered. Um, we also saw again um, the movement towards implementation, as Ian said, across a number of sort of the work programmes initiated at COP26. So we have the mitigation work programme, um, the work programme on the global goal on adaptation. Uh, the post 2025 finance goal um, and these outcomes sort of all help progress the work that happened at the UK's presidency so kind of Egypt was where where the ball got rolling on a number of those things um, but again echoing what other people have said um, I think Samada specifically was the fight we had at COP27 to maintain the focus on mitigation um, and keeping 1.5 alive um, we were disappointed not to see more progress on fossil fuels um, and commitments on fossil fuels at COP27. Um, so looking forward to COP28, that will be a key area. Um, but I guess as a minimum, we were, were pleased to see that the deal in Egypt kind of preserves the commitments that were agreed to in, in the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, what would have been even better is if we could have gone further on that ambition. So we need to see more progress on that mitigation area um, ahead of COP28 in the UAE. Um, on science specifically, I guess a few things that we were pleased to see. We saw the welcoming of the Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 reports of the IPCC in the, in the COP27 cover decision um, to kind of acknowledge the importance of that science. Um, we saw the recognition of climate impacts on the cryosphere and the need to further understand that, um, including tipping points and things like that. Um, and in terms of what we didn't see on science that we would have liked to see, again, like I said, raising ambition on mitigation from Glasgow, the reference to the fact that emissions need to peak as soon as possible, which is a key IPCC finding um, that wasn't sort of elevated to any, any COP27 decision text. Um, and again, as I just said, sort of follow through on phase down of coal and commitment to phasing out fossil fuels um, was not covered. Um, so yeah, I guess in terms of what I covered specifically um, was the periodic review, which is an item that kind of reviews the science on the long-term temperature goal, which as John mentioned in Paris was to pursue efforts to limit um, to 1.5 degrees at well below two. Um, so that decision kind of reviewed that goal um, and 
review the latest science. So that's kind of what I was involved in there. So that process was concluded at COP27 um, and now looking forward to COP28 will be the culmination of, of the global stock take, um, which is really important. So that was something that was agreed in the Paris Agreement and is an opportunity for, as, as the name suggests, to kind of take stock of how countries are progressing towards the Paris Agreement and, and how they need to go further. So that's kind of the key step onwards from that conclusion of the, the periodic review and is, is a huge priority for the UK this year is to get an ambitious outcome on the global stock take to kind of raise ambition and move things forward. Um, I think I will hand back over to Richard, but yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Great. Um... Thank you very much for all of you. Um, keeping just about the time, we were a bit over, so I'm going to move it fairly quickly to the panel discussion. Um, and then uh, we'll pick up uh, general question and answers. Uh, there are several uh, questions coming through. Do, do keep them coming through and they will be ranked, so I'll, I'll be able to see what is most popular. Uh, there is a clear theme there. Um, just in terms of, uh, can I start? So we're, it, let's go into the panel discussion, but one of, one of the things where I would like to start, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hear how you want to um, discuss with each other, is this question, which I think uh, John very much underlined. It, it was there behind all your comments, I think, and um, Kate was being a very diplomatic scientist. Um, which uh, I understand you have to be because you are also working for the Department of Energy Security uh, and, and Net Zero. Um, so the word was disappointment. Um, John talked about abject failure. It's a question that Debbie brings up also in the, in the, in the Q&A, so I can refer to it now. That Actually, COP27, with regard to the kinds of ambitions that COP26 laid out, um, COP27 was really quite an abject failure around mitigation. I mean, there were only 29 countries in the world that ratcheted up their targets from out of COP26, and there was only one of the G20, and that was Australia, and that was because of a change of government, and because it was actually quite easy to change the policies from the previous Conservative government. So very little ambition was there at COP27. The presidency itself very much saw itself as as leading Africa, or, you know, whether one places Egypt exactly in Africa or not is not the question here, but they very much uh, you know, put an emphasis on, on development, adaptation, uh, mitigation. You know, I don't know what, Kate, you feel within the negotiations itself, and I do hear your allusions to the working programs, but I think for a lot of us outside of the tent, as it were, uh, mitigation was just not the focus, as Guterres said. It hasn't been addressed at this COP. Uh, we got the global stock take, as um, Kate, you said, uh, coming up for COP28, so the two-year review um, since COP26 as the last fifth annual review. It's obviously very important that we know where we are. And in terms of John's point about the collective goal of mitigation, we're just not there. And as a result, 1.5 looks highly unlikely now. Um, John said even in his comments that he'd move now to two degrees as the next target. Um, can we keep, what is the ambition, as Debbie puts it in the Q&A, what kind of ambition, I'd like to start there, please, to all four of you, what kind of ambition can we still have with regard to 1.5? This is a question that's being asked all over the place, and I do think um, we need to have a, our own responses. And clearly within that, I mean, just thinking, uh, Ian, with regard to climate finance, quite clearly, when one thinks of the trillions that have to be channeled towards the developing countries uh, for them to keep their mitigation targets. Um, indeed, is this really dependent on, on the de-risking of capital and the, the channeling of capital there where it does not precisely want to go at the moment? Uh, in other words, I'd like to start with a slightly pessimistic uh, note and see if we can build up a certain amount of optimism as we go along. Maybe we won't be able to, but there's my question. Was it an abject failure on mitigation? Did anyone, apart from, John said it. Maybe I, I, I said it already in a way, Richard. Yeah, you said it already. I mean, John, to come back on any further comments you'd like to make. Yeah, um, I suppose I'd Perhaps I'd... in terms of, you know, Debbie, well, what ambition can we now have? And how do we, you know, how do we put that 
how do we put that ambition in place? I mean, you talked about two degrees, but you know, where does the ambition now go? What kind of action is necessary? And perhaps Ian, you can come in around the finance there, uh, and Sumedha and Kate follow on. And I am aware, Kate, that you know, um, you obviously, you know, you, you're, you're talking within the negotiations, and you'll probably want to continue to talk in those terms. So there we are. John, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose one one sort of issue that I've always had is about the time scale of framing around mitigation. Um, so um, the fact that we have targets often framed around 2050, I think has been incredibly detrimental to the whole mitigation process because it allows this context of something that will happen in different political cycles and sometime in some future generation. And that is completely opposite to the science of cumulative emissions. And therefore, I actually am not so keen on having a, we need to be net zero by 2050, by 2060, and so on. I would like to actually see a total allocated carbon budget agreed for the next 10 years, uh, which we globally will meet within that. Um, and that's the kind of agreement which then aligns with the science, as opposed to sort of this... Um, uh, fictional date in the future that we can all uh, sort of dismiss and, and not worry about too much. Um, I am really concerned, and this is slightly anecdotal, I suppose, but I, I am really concerned with this pathway that mitigation will gradually disappear as an option. And we'll just be thinking about, you know, how much money can we get away with giving people who are affected by the hideous consequences of climate change. So keeping it on the agenda and pushing for a short term total global carbon budget, I think, is one of the key solutions uh, and, and what I'd like to see appear at, at the car. Otherwise, I presumed, John, what, what you're saying is we could be in this constant cycle of expectation and then disappointment. No, completely. And also we see this in the UK and I, and I, I don't want to make uh, Kate would be limited in what she can say here, but, but I'll say it as someone who isn't so limited. And, and that is that I feel that we're actually rejecting the cheapest options to reduce emissions because they involve changes in social structures and they involve challenging vested interests and, and where power sits. Um, a good example would just be the retrofit of homes in the UK. It, it is a cheap option. It's an option which supports millions of households. It's got job creation behind it. It needs government support, but it isn't taken forward. And then the narrative switches to, oh, look how expensive it is to deal with this. And then the next step is to say that it's too expensive to deal with this. It's an adaptation problem, and it's a problem of trying to, in essence, um, pay for some of the damages that we've caused. So I think we've got to keep a profile on, on that sort of sliding uh, scale, I suppose. Great, John. Thank you. Tomato, do you, I mean... Do you mean, in the context of this, I mean, you talked a lot about the sort of the watering down of the energy policies there uh, at COP27. So on this question of mitigation, where are you with regard to, you know, the energy transition, the fact that, you know, we talked about low emission at COP27, which obviously was quite scandalous for people who want to get precisely um, take out the fossil fuel sector um, and stop further excavation. Um, where are you on this, you know, on this question of mitigation with regard to the overall energy transition and the continuing use of fossil fuels? Um, so I think uh, I, I personally feel that the way COP negotiations are going, uh, things are going to get increasingly political and, and we have to connect it with the global situation and how things are progressing in the next couple of years. Um, you know, in the next five years, we might just see a lot of uh, policies which which might not be as conducive as we'd like it to be for, you know, achieving 1.5 degrees um, in any case. I personally think that um, if if we have to, I mean, I, I, I seriously think that 1.5 degrees should be achievable in theory. And for that, one needs to take leadership outside of the climate negotiation and it, it's it's something that I feel uh, should be possible by some of the leading countries because climate negotiations are a very very limiting sort of uh, platform in a way where all countries need to be uh, brought in together and therefore we need to think of an alternative uh, dialogue system between the countries who can deliver some of the biggest chunks of uh, you know uh, emission reductions in a very quick time um, and work towards it, basically. 
I also think that energy is going to, of course, play an important role, but it's going to be the thing to focus on. Uh, and that's because we are looking at some fantastic results with the renewable energy uh, you know, based uh, electricity generation and some of the fantastic investment cycles we are looking at uh, even in 2022. Um, and, and I have hopes there, but I still think that somebody or a set of countries needs, need to come forward in a separate platform and really push through uh, to achieve the 1.5 degrees. Uh, COP negotiations might not be the best platform for that. Mm. So what that would be for you, that in a sense, COP should change its format and there should be some intergovernmental discussions there, but among, for example, countries of the G20. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I mean, uh, I, I really sympathize with the um, uh, with the idea of the global carbon budget. I just see it to be a politically very, very difficult proposition uh, to be agreed upon. Um, and which is where I think, you know, a handful of countries uh, going forward with, uh, specific incentives and disincentive incentives involved um, would be the way forward for this. Mm, that's very interesting. I, before going to Ian, um, Kate, could you come in here? I mean, what do what do you feel around th these kinds of proposals? I mean, where are you? Um, given from where you're where you're able to speak, what 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 are you what, what are your thoughts around this mitigation? And where is action now possible uh, that is serious um, and concrete? Yeah, definitely. I've um, got a few points actually based on what, what others have said. Um, I think firstly, sort of coming back to Debbie's question on, on 1.5 um, and how, how to keep it alive, I guess. And I, I think from a purely scientific perspective, as Samaid has just alluded to as well, it, it is still technically feasible. Um, don't get me wrong, it's, it's getting increasingly unlikely. But I think the the danger here is that we slip from oh we've missed 1.5 so it's two and I think the narrative that we're pushing here from from a science perspective is that every increment of warming matters so okay maybe we've missed 1.5 but let's stay under 1.6 and you can see how the climate impacts change at, at every increment of warming so it, it's quite dangerous to to have that kind of narrative over 1.5 has been missed so now let's just aim for two and kind of look at 0.5 degree increments so um we're doing a lot of work scientifically at the moment to understand what the impacts are um so working with the research community to understand what the impacts are at those different increments of warming um looking at the impacts of overshooting 1.5 and coming back down and what those uh, what the implications are of sort of different levels of overshoot there um, in terms of tipping points, um, reversible and irreversible impacts and things like that. So that's something that we're trying to bring into the process. Um, and then on John's point about the sort of long term targets, um, I think, again, what we try to push as the UK and, and what we use the, the COP and the UNFCCC process for is to push for the nationally determined contributions, which are on much shorter timescales, so sort of five-year timescales, as I mentioned before. And again, I think they are more important than our long-term net zero ambitions, because as you say, you're, you're much more accountable to a five-year target than one that's kind of 20 years down the line. Um, so that's, I think I mentioned that in my presentation earlier with the, mm -hmm. the global stock take, that will be a key place where a decision can hopefully be reached to send a signal to what those nationally determined contributions should be for 2035, which is the, the next milestone. Because as you said, Richard, the, the amount of countries that updated those since COP26 was was disappointing. Um, so we really need to push push that forward um, based on, on what the, the science says. So those contributions should be in line with what the science says is a 1.5 degree pathway. Um, and then finally, I think, on sort of touching on your original question about whether COP was a failure and, and what this process can actually achieve. Um, I think we know, or I certainly know from having been in it, that these these processes can be extremely frustrating and slow and, and difficult. And I, I think on a personal level, I agree with a lot of the things that other people have said, um, but it is, it's the only process we've got um, internationally and multilaterally so we have to work with it and then I think that what Samoda was saying really comes into play here and that it's the only 
multilateral process where everyone is signed up, but that doesn't stop other initiatives from happening. So Richard, you mentioned the G20, the G7, those are important areas where we can push climate ambition and the bilateral relationships. I think Samada mentioned the Just Energy Transition partnerships. And there are all sorts of ways that we can work to go further than the decisions that happen in, in the COP process. So I, I think it's important um, but it's it's not the be all and end all, if you see what I mean. That's very clear. No, thank you, Kate. I'll I'll ask um I'll go back to Ian, but I'll ask John to come back to you and just give a, a quick response to what you've said, Kate, because it's in many ways your response has been an interesting strategic response to what John was saying. And I'd be nice to hear John come back and give give his thoughts on what you've said very carefully. Ian, on these on this question then of mitigation in general, COP27. Coming from finance, the kinds of you know the kinds of disappointments you had, um, and the questions you know the huge challenges of reform of the international uh, financial architecture, those kinds of questions. What do you think is possible? Where do you situate yourself with regard to th this question of uh, of mitigation in general and the COP process? So, I think in terms of things like the one and a half degree target that can't change. And I agree with Kate that for every small incremental change in that target, then we know there's different climate impacts and so on. And so you end up at it'll be less than two and a half. And that's we know the consequences of that. And I think with regards to finance, that target of one and a half degrees that was agreed at Paris, as soon as if we let any of that slip, then I think finance will look at it and go, well, it's not a real target. Yeah, that investment, maybe we don't have to put money there. And so I think we have to really look at two different things. One is, if we're over the target, we're over the target, but that's the target. And it should be a hard target, a one and a half. And anything above that is some degree of failure, and it's a collective failure globally. But if we don't hold finance to that target that was agreed then, and that's what the science tells us, then I think finance will weaken its resolve because it's not a clear target. And so you need to gov governments globally to enforce that. I think the other thing in an economic sense is I've had quite a few discussions with people about overshooting. So what happens if we go to 2.1, 2.2, and then we get it back down? And that's probably quite a likely scenario. But I think what's then never discussed is it doesn't cost much to overshoot actually we'll overshoot by not changing our behavior. We'll overshoot by quite a huge amount. However, the cost of then getting back down and getting to target is just so much higher than anything you would do to try and keep under. And so from a finance perspective, for me, it makes more sense to make the investments that try and hit the hard target as opposed to letting the target move because the economic cost of them trying to get where they need to be is just so much bigger. And I think part of that is then this interplay between private capital and governments. And so I think there has to be some understanding of how can we de-risk things because finance has a purpose such as it is. And so you're you put your money in your pension scheme to get a pension and that you've got a legal obligation there. So there needs to be some understanding of what the purpose of finance is. Now, we can then have a debate about whether that purpose is aligned properly to what we're trying to achieve globally for climate. But in many instances, particularly when you're looking at mitigation um, and you're looking at those countries that are having climate impacts just now and very, very severe ones, I think the the risk profile of that isn't clear to people. And so the governments have a role to help support the investment get in and de-risk it in some way. And one of the big things in finance is everybody likes to be a fast second mover. So that initial program of de-risking, however we want to shape that, once people have good sort of visibility of how this can be done, how it can benefit society, how it can help us achieve the targets, and we can make some money off it so we can pay somebody their pension or whatever else. I think that would be one of the crucial mechanisms in, in, in unlocking uh, large amounts of capital. 
Ian, can I just very quickly before I, I ask John to come in and just make a you know a comment on Kate and then any any of the four of you come in on each other in the last five minutes uh, that you want to pick up on not necessarily on the question, uh, but I did want to press that since it's a, it's really a very important question for COP twenty seven and transition to COP twenty eight as we all know. Ian, um, you know, you know this sort of this initiative called the Bridgetown Initiative coming from the Barbados government. <clears throat> Uh, which is, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be the IMF and the World Bank meetings in, in this spring. And then I think Macron, President Macron of France, is going to hold a meeting with uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, Mia Motley. Um, it was there at COP27. It also was advanced very clearly at the uh, G20 uh, um, uh, next to COP27. Um, one of the interesting things about it, I'd just like to hear your point. You know, we clearly, you know, there are trillions of dollars out there, um, and there are actually trillions of dollars out there in public institutions, not just simply in the private sector. Uh, and these are these special drawing rights and callable ca capital within mul uh, multilateral development banks. One of the things in the Bridgetown Initiative, which I find interesting, we're not going to talk about it here, but just uh, just like your response here in terms of capital that's available is, hey, the money's there. The rich countries don't actually have to dig into their pockets. It's there. It's simply a question of making it available. And the international institutions have not wanted to do that, partly obviously because of credit ratings. Um, what do you think of that argument, that argument that's suddenly coming up from Barbados as one of the most vulnerable countries, given where it is in the world, Yeah, saying, look, you don't have to dig into your pockets. The capital is there. It's locked into the international institutions. You know, it's up to the stakeholders, the, the national governments, to let it be made available to the most vulnerable countries. What do you think of that argument in terms of a transition to COP28? So I think it's a very powerful argument, and I think it makes eminent sense, but it's extremely complicated to do because the institutional structures that sit around the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, they are, again, a very collectively agreed political process, and you've got to look at the roots of where those organisations came from. And so when you then start to think about saying, well, you don't have to put your hand in your pocket, the money's just there, you've still got to then agree the terms by which that money is released. So I think it's a very strong starting point, but I think the, the, the process by which you can enable that to happen at the pace and scale that we need, I think that's that can't... It has to go to that kind of point, I think, uh, both Kate and Sumida have made, which is these processes have to be done outside the COP. It has to be going on now. It has to be happening now. It has to happen much more quickly. And I think when you look at some of the other things that are going on in the world, then money's always available for, for anything, really. We just have to get the politics right. And I think that's the bit that's very hard. Thank you, Ian. That's, that's very important, what you said. So, John, there's Kate saying, look, that's all we've got, that multilateral process. We're all saying other things have to take place as well. Other actors have to come to the fore, uh, forefront. Um, and Kate also said, you know, every point one of degree is important. So let's keep these targets there. They're nevertheless our pathways. John, what do you think about Kate's kind of you know, response to you? Uh, where you were sort of, I'm not say, thinking you were saying let's shift it, but where you were really questioning whether actually the framework of COP was correct in the first place. So I suppose one of the key elements, firstly on the, on the emission side, yeah, every 0 0.1 degree increase is what counts. So um, it's what made, it makes it very difficult when you have a target and then you don't achieve it where are you um uh, you know so imagine on your personal diet you know you, you've exceeded the calorie intake for a week and then you kind of feel like you've personally blown it and you're not sure where to go from there and, I, and and so i suppose that's a danger of having a target in that context but the science is very clear that you want to limit it, uh warming as much as possible and so therefore to me that the task continues and so it doesn't actually break the system down to do that I, there's a quite tri tricky sort of communication part of this, um, and I'll leave that to communication experts to work that out. Um, but the science is clear on that, in my in my opinion. Um, I suppose what I'd like to see at these processes is more honesty. Um, I feel there's a lack of honesty in the debate. 
Um, so if we are to uh, restrict to 1.5, stranded assets are now a, a real possibility. And so we need to openly say that and state that. Um, we also need to be honest that I think we've always had this nice idea that um, the new carbon paradigm will gradually grow and overtake the old fossil fuel dominant paradigm. But those are on timescales which are no longer acceptable. And so we need an honest discussion now about foreclosing options to drive innovation as opposed to just trying to grow the good bit but not talk about the bad bit. Um, so therefore, fossil fuel subsidies needs to be on the on the, the list to discuss about. Um, and we also need to discuss why will we ever consider opening another coal, oil or gas uh, plant in the world? Um, and that's the kind of honesty that we need in the debate. And you sort of listen in on all the sessions and you sort of have this vague feeling that no one's really talking about exactly what they mean. And and that's what I'd really like to see. So I don't necessarily suggest breaking down the whole process. But one which is honest about those goals um, and clearly recognises science, I think it would be a valuable contribution. Thank you, John. Very, very clear response. Thank you. Um, as we pivot over into the Q and A, um, and I have the I have the questions here coming up. Um, I think there is a transition question, and I'm going to um, take it back to Sameda and Kate, um, which is you know. This global stock take, I mean, we, we've all been talking about where mitigation targets are not being met um, and you know whether one should reframe that or not, whether one should look to other actors or not. And it's clearly a question uh, of and, not or. Um, what is the global stock take? Why is it important? Uh, what, is, what are the outcomes that are going to come from it? How does it help climate action and climate ambition? Uh, Tameda, Kate, um, have you got thoughts around that? These are questions that are coming up by, from several people. Um, Smeda, could can I begin with you? And, and then Smeda, could you hand on to Kate uh, on this question of the importance of the global stock take this year? Uh, where's it taking us? You know, when we have been so disappointed around targets, um, what actually is its meaning uh, and where should we place that meaning and, and its purpose? Smeda, could you begin? Absolutely. I think uh, global stock take is going to be uh, the most important thing going forward, and particularly in the case of COP28. And that's primarily because it, it will measure how much we have achieved until now and what have we, be, ha, what have we been doing uh, until now, the exact, I suppose, uh, you know, getting into the metrics of each and everything. Um, uh, so it will really show us in concrete terms, uh, what these actions that have already been taken by some of these countries um, are delivering in terms of emission reductions. Uh, and also, you know, for, sort of uh, make some of these governments who claim, uh, you know, to take uh, a lot of climate actions, uh, basically hold them accountable for the uh, for the actual delivery in terms of emission reduction so i would think global stock take would be helpful in on that front also important i think for two purposes one is um, you know uh, because we have the ratcheting mechanism within the paris agreement so one will uh, sort of get to know how much countries would need to then increase their ambitions and what kind of actual concrete actions will they need to put in place uh, but also, I think it will, uh, at least that is my intuition, uh, that it will throw up very important uh, challenges around data collection and as well as, you know, uh, data reporting. So what are the countries reporting? How much uh, can we trust that? What are the gaps in terms of uh, the data availability? Um, that's, I, I think that's going to be an important part of global stock take. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think I'll stop there and I'll hand over to Kate. Thank you, Kate. Yes, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think I'd agree with everything that Sir has said. Um, I think it's important to recognize that th this is the first global stock take. So I, I, there's not, people don't know what the outcomes are necessarily. That's that's there to be shaped. Um, and I think the what our team that work on the global stock take are, are looking to kind of be thought leaders in that process and, and influence the outcome um, to to make it as ambitious as possible. Um, but yeah, it is, it is an, kind of an innovative process under the COP. So we, we, we don't necessarily know what, what shape that will take. And a lot of that is in the, the presidency's hands as well. So the, the UAE um, and as the incoming presidency and, and Egypt as the current 
COP presidency. Um, I think it it can also speak to, hopefully to, to what John said, it's an opportunity to bring some honesty into the process mm. and, and reflect honestly on the science. So what's happened on the global stock take so far has been um, a series of um, technical dialogues, they're called. So um, anyone can uh, submit inputs into these technical dialogues and they've, they've been opportunities for countries to to discuss the science under the key themes so uh, mitigation adaptation and means of implementation um and and kind of digest what the science says on um progress so far to meeting the agreement and um what is needed in future to to get on the right track um so yeah it 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 kind of remains to be seen i guess but we see this as a, a really key opportunity to raise ambition across all those three pillars of the Paris Agreement um, and to, as Simona said, sort of set the signals for the, the ratcheting and the, the next set of nationally determined contributions. Um, so, yeah, I feel like there, there has been a, a lot of expectation placed on on this. It's, it's probably had um, more sort of attention and engagement from the, the public and kind of wider non UNFCCC community than, than perhaps most other aspects of the COP process has. So um, um, it, it's really exciting opportunity. Um, and I think it's also important to say that it's brought in sort of non, what we call non-party stakeholders, so non-countries in, into the process a lot more than a lot of other processes in the COP have, which is is really important to bring in that um, sort of science, civil society and, and business uh, and NGO voice into, into these processes as well. So yeah okay thank you can i just come back on that i mean just in terms of the sort of you know going back to john you know, the language of honesty you were saying you know maybe the global stop take can help that put forward that language um and to use you know your term and smedes term of accountability this is the first moment of a sudden accounting and accountability um is it going to be, you know, in terms of ratcheting up, I mean, is it going to become a process of, you know, because COP often sort of falls back into that of naming and blaming and finger pointing and so forth. Um, you know that very well within the negotiations. Um, do you fear that it could become that? Um, just so, you know, it's a, a naming and blaming process from one country to another and that it actually um, doesn't help things? Or do you think that this is really a moment where, actually countries who have been on different you know, pathways and differently placed you know, over the last 30 years, be they more in adaptation or more in mitigation, that they actually can come together, that it's a place where things can, that can be more comprehensively thought through and acted upon? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Like you say, that that's, there, there are clear divides along, along lines that are well known in the negotiations, and I, I don't think they're going to sort of stop just because it's the global stock take but I, I don't think that means that it's not an opportunity for all countries to collectively commit to to raise their ambition um recognizing as the paris agreement does that uh, people have different uh national circumstances and different abilities to contribute to reaching that goal so that that is well acknowledged under the global stock take one of the key principles of the stock take is equity um so mm -hmm. hopefully with those principles at, at the core that means that it can collectively raise raise ambition um, and yeah be a, a tool for for enhancing progress rather than kind of I guess perhaps the, the same old that you are mm, so reinforcing yeah. prejudice isn't it and mistrust all right no uh, th thank you very much Kate um, thank you to both Samira and Kate it's a it's a crucial question that was asked I'm going to switch it I'm going to turn to Ian now there's a question that was asked right at the beginning which takes us back um, to finance um, and uh, Ian it's uh, I think you've seen the question but let me just read it out which actors can be most powerful in holding big players in the financial system to their commitments You've mentioned some significant rollbacks, organizations leaving GFANTS, et cetera, to fairly little backlash. And I wonder how best we can avoid other organizations, institutions feeling they could do the same, rollback, in other words. Um, Ian, would you like to come on, uh, on to that particular question? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think this really comes down to 
how we view the finance system. And so within, for the past 50, 60, 70 years, the finance system has always been seen as this efficient way of allocating capital and the capital will go to where it's needed. It will go at the right time because everybody makes money. And actually I think that view of finance is somewhat naive. And so if we think that finance is going to come and save the day, it's not. Finance needs to be directed. And so for me, this really does place a huge emphasis on the role of government to better understand finance and to see finance as a tool that the government has and the governments can use effectively and deploy um, as opposed to something that sits next to government and magically by osmosis just happens to fix all the problems. Um, a sort of controversial thing perhaps to say is it's not clear to me one of the things that got us into this mess is going to get us out of it. So actually finance has and continues to chase returns, which we know are not compatible um, with solving and resolving climate change. So what you've got to then do is say, well, how is it we want finance to organise itself? How do we want it to be aligned to this? And that really comes back to the the boundaries that we as a society put around it. If we don't put clearer lines of demarcation between what finance should be doing and what it shouldn't be doing, then I don't think we'll see it magically happen in the short run. Longer term, it might get there, but the pace at which it has to happen, I don't think can be left to the, the sort of invisible hand of the market. Ian, thank you. And I went back to your previous comments. Um, thank you for the consistency. Um, a question from Anthony to John, and it, it John, it, it, um, it's one of the other questions that comes to you, uh, was pre-registered. Um, John, could you kindly elaborate on what aligning climate policy with economic and social policy would entail? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so I suppose from an economic policy perspective, um, any investment by the government could be aligned with achieving um, low carbon goals and I think the Inflation Reduction Act is an example of that. Um, there would be a response as well from the European Union on this. Um, hopefully the UK, um, well, depending on political outcomes in the future, Labour have already outlined a, a similar strategy to some extent. Um, doesn't mean that others won't, but that that's where they are. So there is about I mean, a significant economic investment program to help grow skills, jobs, um, overcome regional disparities, um, and in essence address the fact that um, enormous amount of investment is needed in the transition. Um, at the same time, um, it's about not doing certain things. So therefore, it would be also about, um, again, using the UK as an example, avoiding £28 billion investment in a road building plan, which locks us into higher levels of energy demand and pushes a route of private mobility over shared mobility. Uh, it would also be ensuring that we remove subsidies as well. And then everything's pointing in the right direction. And from a social perspective, I'd like to see more there is clear links between level of wealth and emissions um, and therefore we've got to be very careful that the changes that are made in essence are uh, made to the groups which are responsible for those emissions um, and this means ensuring in a way a, a just transition for everyone and not just um, ensuring that lower income groups are punished by the actions of high income groups and um, all this to me is heavily evidenced in the literature on how this can happen. Um, all the technologies in place, the social changes are in place. This isn't actually very difficult anymore. I, I think academia has done a pretty good job at describing this along with others. What it comes down to is uh, whether we have the political will, the ability to challenge vested interests, um, the ability to align global markets in a direction that's useful and so on and so on. And, and that's where I think we're at um, at this stage. Thank you very much, John. Um, Sumedha, you know, around just energy transition, you know, all those, those, those framings which are now becoming very dominant. Would you have anything to add from where you are 
with regard to energy to what John has said anything uh, any divergence with John or do you think yes you know we've done the work it's now pretty clear what needs to be done uh, it perhaps goes back to what he uh, what uh, Ian said about finance uh, it's now a question really of political will Smeda would you would you want to uh, add anything to John there in in response to the question he was asked um I I actually actually agree with whatever John said, um, and I think uh, it is very relevant in the way we frame just transitions and the way we um, progress on just transitions. I would maybe just add one um, aspect here that I, I think, and it may just be because uh, I am ignorant on this part, but I think there needs to be also um, a framing of energy systems from the point of view of not just mitigation, but also adaptation as well and uh, climate resilience. And I think that framing is not as mainstream as uh, I think it should be, uh, because energy systems will contribute heavily towards uh, adaptation. And that is, I mean, it's going to be uh, uh, almost, um, you know, uh, it, it, they will feed into each other. So energy systems would be needed for more and more climate adaptation. And we need to ensure that new energy systems are as decarbonized as possible for you know, these changes that are happening socially as well as, uh, you know, from a climate point of view. Uh, so I think that framing needs to be brought out a little more uh, in the literature as well as in the negotiations. I don't see it uh, featuring in our national policies uh, either. Hmm. Thank you. Samantha. Thank you for that uh, additional comment. Um, <clears throat> Kate, can I ask um, your question? That coming you know, coming from from the audience, um, from where you are, Kate, how are you preparing for for the upcoming negotiations of COP twenty eight? Um, that's my first question. There's another question that I want to ask you, but I think um, that one for you. And if after Kate's spoken, if anyone else would like to sort of chip in, you know, how how are they preparing for the upcoming negotiations? Um, but Kate, since you are a negotiator, the question goes to you first. Yeah, of course. Um, so I guess one of the main things on our agenda at, at the moment is um, the release of the IPCC synthesis report. Um, so we'll be doing quite a lot of work internally to disseminate the, the findings of that and ensure that um, all of the negotiating positions are, are based on on that, on the best available science. Um, so that that's kind of an, an in, internal job. Um, the, so as I sort of mentioned in my initial presentation, the, the periodic review, which was a science item that we were responsible for closed at COP27. Um, the other item that we cover is called research. And um, so this is, um, tends to be a, a, a less politicized item under the under the COP, under the UNFCCC, um, and it's an opportunity to look at the research landscape, um, kind of acknowledging the research um, and, and global initiatives that are are going on. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of an example, I think we touched on the, someone asked a question about early warnings for all. So that's um, sort of the work of things like the WMO um, and other international research institutions are covered under that item and looking at highlighting research gaps that can support the, the UNFCCC negotiations and, and the sort of ultimate goal of the, the convention and the Paris Agreement. So we'll be working towards that, um, which involves a lot of work engaging with the research community. So our, our network's there to think about uh, UK priorities and how they, they can feed into the global activities there um so yeah i think they, those are the the main things at the moment i can't really speak for um the individual sort of big ticket um, negotiation items because obviously i yeah work on the the science side specifically before then i, I widen that question out to others and, and probably take off the term negotiations as how are you preparing for the upcoming cop given what you've said previously and that question to samida uh, Ian and John. Can I just ask you another question, Kate, um, which is you know, very specific to the university, but you are an alumni of the university and you did that, that, that MSc. Um, how can staff, the students uh, here, here at the University of Leeds, how, how can they support the negotiation team? Is, is that a relevant question? Um, and if it is, in what way can it be answered? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think we we already um, do a lot of work with with universities, so not only Leeds but others. I think we work closely with um, people might be familiar with the UK Universities Climate Network. I think I've uh, expanded that acronym correctly, um, which was sort of formed in the run up to COP26 while the UK was was COP presidency. So we work really closely with them, which that kind of distills a lot of work across um, the academic community across the UK and into um, I guess channels that into a, a contact point for government so um, I'd recommend engaging with that for those who don't already and, and I'm sure those on on the call do um, so yeah that that's sort of how we engage with the the research community I, I think a good example of this which is slightly different to what we've been discussing but the item that I just mentioned the part on systematic observations um, we have sort of a high level working group across government um, and a, a really strong community of earth observations academics who who come in and there's an opportunity at those sessions to present research and posters um, at the COP um, and even sometimes be be there at, on on panels um, presenting to those um, two negotiators so yeah there's there's lots of different ways for for the research community to, to get involved and and follow these negotiations Yes, and you know, if there are any questions out there around how how we can help, please please address the um, the, the the COP uh, task force here at Leeds as well. Connect as a bridge. Um, Kate, thank you. Um, Ian, can I come back to you just on something which, which, in a sense, we we very much foreground at the beginning and has sort of taken its distance, as it were, or faded into the distance, which is yeah one of the clear successes was seen at least um, uh, and often cited uh, at COP27 was the loss and damage uh, facility uh, set up, although the recipients and the contributors, there was no clarity about it either. Um, and Kate, you may want to come back on this as well from where you are, but Ian, you know, um, from where you are, has any progress been made on that uh, since last November? Um, and will the progress be made? Is it scheduled to be made at COP28? And Kate, if you have anything to add from where you are, please do. As do, you know, um, John uh, Smeda, if you have anything to add as well. So the loss and damage facility, Ian, where are we? So to the best of my somewhat limited knowledge, not a lot of progress has been made. Um, so when you look at, I think, in an implementation COP, that was actually a big announcement. And so, and I think if you look at the timing of it, it was probably quite an intense negotiation to get that agreement. And it was the G77 holding out for quite a long time and putting a huge amount of pressure on to get that fund at least acknowledged that it should be created. But that acknowledgement, going from there to then actually working out how do you operationalise it, how do you make it work, how do you get the money in, and who, who's first in the queue, who gets what, I don't think there's been anything like the progress that I would have loved to have seen. If in a very naive way, you would announce it one month and six months later, it's up and running and going. So I think we've still got quite a lot of hard jobs to do both to get the money in and also to then work out the mechanism by which money's allocated out. Great. Would anyone else like to add anything from where they are on, on loss and damage, the loss and damage facility? Where's it going? No. Um, Kate, perhaps you could just come back on, because it is interesting, this one, because it takes us again to what are the climate realities now and where there is real vulnerability and how the... <clears throat> global community, <clears throat> if there is one, uh, is re uh, reacting to it. To go, to go back to Neil's question, which you picked up in what you said previously, uh, Kate, um, Neil saw says, COP28 pre-debates speak of climate change early warning systems, which are obviously vital for several countries. The UN's ambitious plan of a global early warning system funded by 3.1 billion over the next five years. Um, Early warning systems seem to have failed in the past, so why should it work in the future? Uh, what's different? And can I tack on to that? And it's a question for Ian, and Ian, you may not have a response. You know, is, is that money available? Is, you know, that money has been put up, but is it actually available? Um, Kate, do you want to come back to that? Because I know you alluded to it in what you said previously, but there was the direct, um, we didn't address it directly. 
Yeah, sure. And I guess I'll preface this. I'm I'm by no means an, an expert on early warning systems. Um, but I think the so the initiative itself is led by the WMO, I believe. So it's not sort of something that happens under the COP process itself. But uh, the reason I referred to it was because it was acknowledged in the the research and systematic observations decision at COP27 as something that is hugely important. Um, and I think, so with Neil referring to, it seems to have failed in the past. I think the, the UK's position on these is, is about making sure these commitments are implemented effectively. So yes, early warning systems for all um, is great, but we want, we want to make sure that that's done properly. Um, so that, that's kind of our stance on it. So I, I think it's, it's a hugely important thing for a lot of developing countries, vulnerable countries, especially sort of small island states, which are really vulnerable to the impacts that early warning systems can help protect against. So I think it's an important aim to have. Um, I'm glad that it was recognised in the decision text at COP and sort of looking forward to to working towards that goal and make sure that it's implemented as effectively as as possible so that they're effective early warning systems, not, not just kind of an empty commitment to make sure that they're there. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, right, we, we've got five minutes left. There's been a lot going on here. I mean, quite clearly, COP28, um, there's going to be, be the, it'll be refocused onto uh, mitigation. I think everyone's clear about that within the context also of the global stock take and, and the three pillars of the Paris Agreement in general, as Kate took us through earlier. Uh, clearly, there will be a focus also on loss and damage and a, a major focus with that on finance, both with regard to loss and damage facility, uh, but also questions of mitigation and adaptation. And we know that the trillions that are involved in that. Um, lots of foci then, but COP28 would seem, everyone would, seems to be saying COP28 is nevertheless very important, even if we have a lot of questions for the COP process at this moment. And we are beginning to think more and more of other venues and other actors working in parallel with it. Could I ask uh, just a one minute sum up from from the four of you? Um, what your, you know, having having talked, having had this discussion, what, what are your last final thoughts for, for, for everybody? Um, and a, a last final thought on your, uh, the outcome that you really would like to see, and it has to be a realistic outcome, clearly. Uh, from COP28. Uh, I'm going to go in a sense in reverse order. I'm going to ask uh, Sumeda to go first. Sumeda, um, final thoughts and one outcome from COP28 that is realistic that for you is very important. Uh, for me, I think the key outcome that I would like to see is the you know revival of the 1.5 degrees uh, target right on the table and uh, you know, securing as many uh, ratcheted up ambitions as possible from all the countries involved. And uh, yeah, I, and I think that would be an outcome, at least as the first step towards anything meaningful um, beyond COP28. So yeah, so for me, it's Thank the you. prioritizing of that. Ian. So I'll get a very brief very clear, I hope. I would like to see the money start flowing. I don't care the mechanism by which it flows, but if the money doesn't start flowing, it's just going to, it's just going to be a very, very painful process. We need to see it flow and we need to see it flowing now. Thank you for that clarity. Kate. Thank you. Yeah, I think what I'm motivated by, and I think from what's been said today, what a lot of people on this call seem to be motivated by is making sure that these decisions are based on science and are aligned with science um, and kind of making that central to the UNFCCC process um, as far as we can. Um, and I guess more specifically, as we mentioned earlier, using the global stock take as a, as a key vehicle to do that and um, to raise ambition on mitigation, get closer to the 1.5 aligned pathway um, and yeah, hopefully see more action. Thank you, Kate. And John? Yeah, I would like to see acknowledgement in the main text of the need for fossil fuel phase out. 
um, and to extend just beyond discussions of coal to actually include all fossil fuels, because that links to Kate's point about the science. Um, I think you know we're fairly clear that fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels, causes climate change. Um, I think we've passed that kind of controversy millions, you know, decades ago. Um, so for it to be acknowledged in the text um, and to define the pathway, the path forward would be fantastic. Thank you, John. Thank you all four. Um, on behalf of the COP27 task force, um, and you know, I know Vanessa and Shona working in the background, thanks to you very much as well. Um, thank you to all of you uh, for this discussion, uh, which I found very, very focused and, and, and clear in, in, in direction of travel. Um, thank you to those of you who put questions, to those of you who, who participated did it silently, um, some great questions, and I hope we've answered as many as possible. Some were not, but I think they were answered indirectly through other responses. Uh, the recording uh, will be available. Uh, I think Vanessa has put something in the chat. Uh, it, you can... Uh, you can reach it at climateatleads.ac.uk. I don't know whether it's going to simply be put up on YouTube or not, but contact that uh, email address, climateatleads.ac.uk, and uh, Vanessa or someone else will respond to you. Um, that was a very full one and a half hours with lots of very interesting discussion. Uh, my thanks again to all of you. Um, and hopefully we will see each other again in the context of COP28 and uh, at least some concrete ambition being on the ground. Uh, thank you. Have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye.